Okay, we're online. Um, so thank you very much uh, for agreeing to take part in our conversation. I'm pleased to introduce to our listeners uh, John Sellers, Professor of Philosophy at London University, a specialist in Hellenistic philosophy in general and Stoicism in particular. Uh, my name is Stas Naranovich. I am facilitator of Moscow Stoic community. Uh, Unfortunately, my practice of spoken English is very, very modest, so I will focus on my list of uh, questions and maybe ask some additional ones. Uh, first of all, I must thank you for your works now translating in Russian, a book about uh, Epicurus. Uh, by the way, how he spelled in English, Epicurus or Epicurus? Epicurus. Epicurus, okay, uh, silly question. A uh, book about Epicurus has been published now. Uh, lessons in Stoicism will be published soon. And later this year, I hope, uh, your big book on Stoicism will be released in uh, another publishing house uh, at Marginen. Uh, I'm sure the Russia audience will appreciate uh, all these works. Uh, unfortunately, I, uh, I also have some bad news. Uh, last Friday, uh, the presentation of the fourfold remedy uh, was to take place at the book fair uh, on Red Square in Moscow. And uh, I was supposed to speak there as a science editor of the translation of the book. Uh, however, organizers uh, of the book fair uh, forbade me to participate uh, and the presentation of the book was uh, canceled. Uh, along with several other events of the pub publishing house. Um, I'm pretty shocked by this. And um, to be honest, I have no other assumptions uh, except that the reason was my anti-war position or maybe connections with some opposition journalists in exile. Uh, at the last Stoicon X in uh, Moscow, organized by me, um, there was a discussion on political uh, persecution in Russia and how we should respond to that. Perhaps this is the reason. Um, last year, I spoke at this uh, book fair on Red Square, and everything was fine. Uh, it was a presentation of a new book uh, uh, of Massimo Piliucci. Uh, but last year, there was no aggressive war unleashed by Russia. So I guess that's the reason, and uh, it's pretty sad and scary. Um, nevertheless, uh, the book about Epicurus is wonderful, and let's start our conversation with a question about the format. Um, academic scholars like you uh, rarely write such popular works for mass reader. Um, what prompted you to write Lessons in Stoicism and the Fourfold Remedy? Um, thank you. Yes, that's a, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question, and I think for quite a while, I was actually um, slightly wary of writing that kind of book. And um, other people had been writing popular books on Stoicism in particular, and, um, and some of them I thought were very good. So I thought, well, I'll just leave it to those guys. They can do that, and I'll stick with the more academic work. And then the publisher approached me and asked if I would do something. And I said, well, I don't really want to write something that looks a bit like a self-help book because I don't really feel qualified. I mean, nothing against self-help books, but I don't really feel qualified to be giving that kind of advice. Um, and they showed me a, a, a very different book that they published um, recently, which was a, a combination of introducing a topic with bits of biographical information. And, um, and some of that was biographical information about the, the subjects. Some of it was biographical information, autobiographical information about the author. I didn't want to do that, but it was a really nice model of how you could introduce the lives of individuals with some of their key ideas and bring out the kind of the practical side of it, but without... Um, explicitly presenting it as a self-help guide. These are the things you should do. And so it was only really when I kind of saw this model about how you could, uh, how my, you could do it, that I thought, yeah, 
that's something that I could do where I wouldn't be stepping too far out of my comfort zone. So it, that was really the process. Yes, uh, great that you agreed uh, to write uh, such a book. Uh, so let, let's talk about some difficulties uh, of Epicurean uh, philosophy. Epicureans are often seen as uh, a kind of uh, isolationists who hide in their garden and completely ignore society. Again, the famous Epicurus imperative, uh, Lat Hebiosus, live unnoticed or stealthy. Um, in the fourfold remedy, you write about the importance of friendship for Epicureans, but could you tell a little more about the attitude of the Epicureans uh, to society? Because it seems to me that uh, this isolationism of Epicureans is more of a stereotype. Uh, Epicurus himself wrote hundreds of treaties that were known far beyond Athens, and the late Epicurean uh, Diogenes uh, built a huge wall in the middle of his city with the main dogmas of uh, Epicureanism inscribed on. Uh, and um, this is hardly the behavior of uh, isolationists. Obviously, the Epicureans had some kind of message to the world, and they did not limit their philosophy to the garden or to other local Epicurean communities. Um, yes, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, so you're absolutely right. Um, the Epicureans didn't want to completely cut themselves away from wider society, it seems. Um, as you say, they're, they're writing books, they're presenting their ideas to wider audiences. But the one thing that they seem slightly um, cautious about is getting involved in organised politics. So, in effect, what they seem to be saying is don't go into a career in politics don't get involved in the running of the, the city-state. Um, if you do that, you're just going to experience all sorts of um, uh, psychological turmoil. It's not going to be conducive to living a tranquil life. And, you know, we can think of lots of famous examples. So before Epicurus, you might think of Socrates. Um, things do, do not go well for him. Um, a little later, someone like Cicero, um, things don't go well for him either. And later again, Seneca. So there are lots of examples from the ancient world of where intellectuals have, have got involved in politics in some way or another, and, and things have not gone smoothly for them. So there's that kind of concern. Um, now, of course, what conclusions we draw from that for the present day is obviously quite complicated because Epicurus is talking about the politics of the small city-state of Athens that, that he was familiar with. So we perhaps need to be cautious before we start drawing conclusions from today. But one of the big issues that he stresses is, and this connects to the issue of friendship that you raised, um, is a contrast that he draws between relationships based on friendship on the one hand and what he calls relationships based on justice. And by justice, I think he just means um, legal justice, so the laws of the city, rather than any notion of natural justice. And he says, well, the laws of the city are basically based on um, distrust, right? We, we have laws to protect ourselves from other people because we're not sure how they're gonna to behave towards us or if they have behaved badly towards us, we want some kind of way in which we can um, uh, respond to their bad behaviour. And a lot of people will only follow the laws of their, um, um, of their state because they're um, concerned about punishment. So the whole system is set up on, on distrust and fear, Epicurus says. And that's not a healthy basis for, for, for a community. So that's, I think, part of his suspicion about traditional politics. And then in contrast to that, when he talks about friendship, he says, well, if you think about the way in which uh, friendship relationships work, um, they're based on mutual respect and sympathy and support. Um, friends help each other out. And they do so in a way that's kind of more or less unspoken, right? There's no contract or agreement. Um, and when you build up these really positive social relationships, 
Um, you have people helping each other out, not based on fear or mistrust, but based on you know a, um, a something much more positive. So I think that's one of the reasons why he's skeptical of of traditional politics. But as you rightly say, um, once we kind of take into account this idea of friendship, we can see that they're not trying to be completely antisocial. Yeah, I see. And actually, I think there is some exceptions uh, from Epicurean attitude to politics, uh, like um, in, Ro in Roman Republic, like Titus Pomponius At Atticus, I, I don't know how, how he spelled in English, friend of Cicero, and uh, to, to whom a uh, bunch of uh, Cicero letters um, addressed. Uh, and from these letters, we uh, knew that uh, uh, this man, uh, Tit Pamponi Etic, uh, was uh, uh, Epicurean. At least he has some sympathies to Epicurean philosophy. Uh, and nevertheless, uh, he uh, take an active part in uh, politics of the Rome. So uh, maybe there, there, is not, there, there was not a big contradiction between this, um, between, between uh, Epicurean uh, philosophy uh, and Lathebiosis imperative and uh, the attitude to the politics of the um, vir bonus of, of Rome, Roman Republic. Uh, uh, yes, and there were other people in uh, in Rome that embraced Epicureanism, but were still happy to um, play their part. So, if I remember rightly, Brutus and Cassius, the assassins of Julius Caesar, I think were both um, Epicureans. Yeah, good examples. And uh, what uh, no, about? Uh, about the garden, what are main sources about how daily life in the garden looked like? Uh, if I'm not mistaken, there is practically no information about this in the letters and fragments of Epicurus himself. Uh, was the garden like a kind of autonomous agriculture farm with the cultivation of vegetables and other food for the sustenance, uh, sustenance of community members? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. There's there's very little clear information, um, and I certainly haven't found much either. So we know it was a private piece of property. We know that it was outside the walls of the city, not far at all, but, but outside the city walls. Um, it was a place where this community came together. Um, presumably, they were they were indeed growing you know, um, fruit and vegetables, or whatever, so they could live as um, um, self-sustainably. Um, I, I presume, and I don't know for sure, I presume that the that, that people were actually living there. It was, a, it, was a, it was a kind of a residential community, but I don't know for sure. We, we really don't have much information. There is one piece of information we have that suggests that Epicurus himself owned a house within the city of Athens. Um, so that might imply that he didn't live on the site. Um, um, but yeah, it's very, very difficult. And um, we know that it was, a, um, it was a community open to both men and women. So we know that it was mixed. Um, but beyond that, frustratingly, um, we know very little. And we don't know for sure exactly where it was. Um, the archaeological site hasn't been found. Um, we've just got a, a, a couple of descriptions of its vague location. Yeah, it's very, it's very sad. I, I think Cicero some, some, uh, writes something about House of Epicurus in his letters that, that uh, was ruined in the time of Cicero. And somebody asked uh, uh, him uh, to restore it, if, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and uh, let's talk a little about um, Epicurean ethics. It's well known that Epicurean ethics revolves around the concept of pleasure, uh, while the concept of uh, virtue uh, plays an instrumental role for them. In the epistle to, uh, in the letter to Menecheus, Epicurus says that uh, the virtues have grown into one with a pleasant life, 
and the pleasant life is inseparable from uh, virtues. Uh, here we have a certain synthesis of pleasure and uh, virtue. Uh, one presupposes the other. But in the surviving fragments, we have a much more shocking statement of uh, Epicurus. Uh, it's fragment 79, I believe. Um, I write it. Prospectu to kalokai to skinos auto, traumatzusin, rotten medeni and redanen paye. So I spit upon the beautiful and those who vainly admire it when it does not produce any pleasure. In the light of this statement, what was uh, the, relation, the relationship between virtue and pleasure in Epicurean ethics? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as you say, um, pleasure is the fundamental highest good. So anything else, whether it be virtue or, or, or whatever it might be, it only is going to have value insofar as it contributes to pleasure or removes pain. Um, so, um, I, I mean, as you say, it, it simply becomes instrumental. Um, I mean, that very polemical comment that you read out, I mean, you can imagine that Epicurus might want to say things like that um, simply to challenge the claims that almost everyone else is making, that virtue is the most important thing, right? Because almost all, all of the other philosophical schools active at the time all inspired by Socrates in some way, whether it be Platonists, Aristotelians, or Stoics, are all going to say that virtue is the, mo is the most important thing, the highest good. So I suspect that's kind of polemical, right, in order to really show that his position is very, very different. Um, but, but virtue can also be good, as you say, if it cultivates and contributes to, to living a, a pleasant life. And... Um, and, and given what we were saying a moment ago about friendship, you know, the idea that, you know, having good social relationships with other people, acting well towards people, um, treating them, uh, treating them well, um, that all of this is, is something pleasant and that contribute to a good life is something that I think Epicurus would have no problem with at all. And again, I mean, the, the, the idea that pleasure is the highest good might make us think of someone interested in great excess. Um, but of course, Epicurus thinks that in fact, we should be very modest and cautious about the pleasures that we enjoy and certainly not excessively pursue things like food and drink and those sorts of things. So again, the traditional virtue of moderation is something that would actually fit quite well with the, the wider Epicurean outlook. And uh, how do you think uh, um, was uh, was um, any influence of Socrates on Epicurus? Um, I don't think I don't think people usually think there was. Um, I mean, sure, surely he must have been some kind of of point of reference in the background, given that he was such a such a significant uh, a figure in the history of philosophy, even then. Um, but overall, it looks as if Epicurus is uh, looking back to Democritus. And I mean, Democritus is of course famous for his physical theory of atomism that the Epicureans take up. Um, but there's also a lot of ethical material in Democritus that survives. And Epicurus, I think, is drawing on that ethical material from Democritus too. Um, and a number of other figures that were around in between Democritus and Epicurus himself, all of whom um, preached the kind of importance of um, tranquility or um, ataraxia. So that's the, the tradition that he seems to situate himself within. And of course, we often describe Democritus as a pre-Socratic, but he's in, in fact, he was a, a, direct, life, contemporary, yeah. a direct contemporary of Socrates. Uh, you know, at exactly the same time. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, ancient Stoics were widely known for the criticism of Epicurean hedonism. Uh, nevertheless, Seneca, a very severe critic of the Epicureans, allows himself, uh, to my view, quite Epicurean passages in some of his treatises. For example, in the De Tranquillitate Animi, he writes something like uh, that, 
we must indulge the mind and give it leisure in place of nourishment and energy. And I especially like this phrase. Sometimes we should even come close to tipsiness, not as to draw, drown us, but to calm us down. For this washes away our cares and steers the mind deeply and remedies sadness. So the story calls for drinking a healthy measure of wine uh, in order to relax and not to be sad. Quite hedonistic approach, isn't it? Uh, could you tell us a little more about the role of pleasure in Stoic ethics and how the Stoic attitude to pleasure differed from the Epicurean one? Yeah, so I mean, the, the difference is really is really quite stark. Um, even though someone like Seneca later can uh, appear very sympathetic to aspects of Epicureanism, so but for the Stoics, pleasure is one of the four negative emotions that ought to be avoided, right? So um, pleasure is the is the, the the bad emotion, the negative emotion that you experience when you think that something good is present right now. But of course, the Stoics are going to say that there isn't anything genuinely good present right now, because the only thing that's genuinely good is, is virtue. So nothing external is genuinely good. At best, all you're going to do is encounter something that's preferred, that's something that you'd rather have. Um, so the Stoics are going to, strictly speaking, the Stoics are going to warn us away from pleasure, say pleasure is a bad thing. Once you once you start to think, oh, that was really good, I really enjoyed that, then you're going to want it again and again. And before you know it, you're going to fall into desire. Or even if you enjoy it, enjoy something, and then it's taken away from you, then you're going to feel distressed that you've no longer got access to that thing that you're enjoying so much. So, yeah, strictly speaking, the Stoics are going to say, avoid pleasure. Um, it's a really dangerous trap. Um, it might seem... Um, it might seem innocuous to start off with, but before you know it, it's going to generate desire and frustration. Um, and that's going to be something much harder to, to be able to control. Yes, big difference. Uh, so I, I have a few questions about um, contemporary, contemporary situation and modern stoicism. Uh, you, are, you are one of the founder members of the modern stoicism group uh, that has achieved um, impressive reach and popularity of the past 10 years. Uh, how do you assess the path that the group has gone from the small workshop at Exeter University to the worldwide movement? And um, what are the challenges facing the group and the movement today? Yeah, I mean, it's been, it's been, um, it's been an incredible journey and it's not one that we ever expected. Um, I mean, we started off very modestly. Um, the idea, there was never the ambition to see this large global movement because that wasn't something even that we could conceive, right? Um, initially, we just thought if we could get a, maybe a couple of hundred people to try this out uh, as an experiment and see if we could gain some information about whether any of these ancient ideas actually help people or not. Um, and, and we did a bit of you know, promotion and talking to the media and social media, um, just in order to generate some interest so that some people would, would sign up so that we could make this experiment work. Um, but so, yeah, it's been amazing the way in which it's grown and grown. Um, for a while, it was growing really, really quickly. I think the last few years, it's slowed down a little bit. Um, although during the pandemic, there has been a, a big in increase in, of interest in Stoic ideas in particular. Um, I mean, I suppose the biggest challenges are that um, all of us that have been involved basically have other lives. We have other things we do. We have other jobs. And so we're all doing this in our spare time, um, you know, for no for no money. I mean, none of us are none of us are really getting paid for this. Um, I mean, you know, if someone is doing something particularly time intensive, and we've got some funds so that we can make it possible for them to do that, they they might get something. But no one's really being paid. So yeah, I mean, the the challenge is just to kind of 
find the time to, to keep it going. Um, so we've not done as much as we could. We could have done a lot more if we'd have had the, the space. But um, we've brought some new people in over the last few years. So the group has expanded and that's really positive. You bring in fresh perspectives and new ideas. Um, so hopefully we can continue to grow. Um, we've had some interesting developments over the last couple of years. We developed a, um, a slightly simpler version of Stoic Week um, for school children, um, which we hope to promote to schools and we made that freely available. Um, and for, and, for what age? Well, sort of, you know, um, well, in, in, the, in the UK, we were secondary school, so, you know, 11 to 16, that kind of age. Um, and, I mean, we would be very pleased to see our materials translated into more languages, right? So if we could have Stoic Greek materials translated into Russian, for instance, yeah, it's, it's, or, it's, it's, or Arabic, Portuguese, Spanish, you know, there are so many big um, world languages um, that would enable us to reach, you know, much larger audiences. Yeah, I have daughter 11 years old, and in uh, now I, I'm start started to thinking about how to put interest in philosophy in general, uh, and maybe in stoicism in her. Uh, uh, and uh, it, it's a hard question. <laughs> um, and what do you think is the reason for today's growing interest in ancient philosophy as a way of life? Um. I think people are just looking for some kind of um, guidance, some kind of set of values that they can use to orient um, how they live and the choices that they make. And I mean, I know that the, I know that the, the 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 history of this in Russia has been very different, but um, you know, in in the West. We, in, in some parts of the West, in, in Western Europe, I should say, there's been a general decline in organized religion. Um, obviously, you know, Russia has a very different history on that front and, and America is a slightly different case as well. Um, but in general, the, I mean, there was, there's, a, there's a large population of people who are broadly secular. They no longer have an organized religion that they turn to for a set of values and guidance for how they might live. And, and those people are looking for something. And kind of, you know, advanced consumer capitalism just tells them, buy more stuff and that will make you happy. And after a while, most people realize that actually that doesn't make you happy. <laughs> just buying more stuff doesn't seem to be the answer. And given the, the current concern about the environmental crisis, you know, people are all the more suspicious of the, of the idea that just buying more stuff and consuming more is going to, in some way, be the answer to anything. And that looks like that's the problem, right? So, so, so what set of values are people going to turn to? Um, and I think, I think, so yeah, so I think people are looking for things. And, and again, in the West, you know, some people have, over the years have turned to something like Buddhism, looking for a kind of a framework. Um, and, and, and a lot of people find that very helpful. Um, but again, for people coming from, from, from the West, from Europe, um, there's a cultural distance from, from something like Buddhism, right? Um, and it's written in, in, in very different languages, which you know, are not the sorts of things you can pick up easily. Um, and some of the texts are, are quite challenging. Whereas for the, for the Stoics in particular, and other bits of ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, um, we've got those much clearer cultural connections. Many of the names are, are ones that are familiar to us. Um, I mean, whether it be, I mean, I'm no expert on the Russian language, but, you know, Russian language has its connections with, with, with Greek, right? And European languages have their connections with, with Latin. So you see the etymologies, the words aren't completely alien. Um, it feels as if people can connect with it slightly more easily than they might be able to with, say, um, Indian or Chinese philosophy. Yes, I agree with you. And one more question about ancient Stoicism, um, questions that were very important for me. Recently, I read in the Bryn Mawr uh, Classical Review, uh, your review of the book of Jack Vishnich, uh, The Invention of Duty. Uh, and uh, you wrote uh, that this book 
converted you to the view that one ought to think of stoic catechonta as duties rather than merely appropriate uh, courses of action. Um, can you please tell what argumentation exactly in the book made you uh, change your point of view? And more broadly, what is the difference between uh, rules interpretation and no rules interpretation of stoic catechonta? Um, yeah, okay. So, so when I, was, when I was younger, when I was a student of philosophy, um, I would have been deeply suspicious of the idea of duty, right? Of, of being told that there are things that you ought to do, right? Um, just like many, you know, teenage students of philosophy, right? Um, so I, I didn't really, I didn't really have much time for the idea of duties, right? Um, and so when I was first encountering Stoicism and I was looking at the different interpretations, um, this idea that the Stoics don't talk about duties, but talk about what's appropriate behavior seemed quite attractive to me, right? So, you know, this is the appropriate thing for you to do, um, but it's not your duty. It's not something you must do. And so with that prejudice in my own mind, I think I thought I like this idea of appropriate actions. And there was a story that has been told in the scholarly literature, which says that um, when Cicero translates the Greek term kathakon into Latin and he uses um, um, officium, um, in, in Latin, this is a kind of a legal term that is slightly more forceful and has this sense of duty. So it was all Cicero's fault. And his translation kind of makes Stoicism sound as if it's about duties and it's not. Okay, and so... What 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 Vishnik, I mean Vishnik's book is is I think very interesting and 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 uh, makes the case for the idea that the early Greek Stoics did indeed mean duty, um, and there were a couple of ways, if I remember rightly. I mean it's, it's a year since I read it, but there were a couple of ways in which he stresses this. One is just to do with the kind of etymology of the word. So almost every single use of the word up until the time that Zeno starts writing. Um, it, it's used with the sense of ought. It's used with a strong sense of this is what you ought to do. It's not that it would merely be appropriate, um, but you must do it. And so he argues, well, it would be very, very odd for Zeno to take up this word and start using it in a way completely different to the way that everyone had used it before him. So I think that's a good kind of linguistic argument. And the, and the second argument, he says, is, well, if part of being a human being, according to the Stoics, is to be a social animal, then it's not merely appropriate that you act well towards other people, right? It's not merely an appropriate thing for you to act justly towards other people if you're a social animal. Surely you must act well, to, act justly towards other people if you're a social animal. That's part of what being a social animal is. And so if you don't, that's not really a choice. It's not really an optional thing, which, which appropriate seems to imply. Um, there's a sense in which you've really gone wrong. You've you failed to be a proper social animal. So you really ought to behave in the right ways. And, and that struck me as a, a, a quite a good argument as well. Yeah, very interesting subject. And since we talked about, uh, you, since you've mentioned uh, uh, that for uh, Stoics were important uh, that human were social animals and uh, um, in uh, uh, lesson in lessons in Stoicism you 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 write um, also that Stoicism encourages encourages us to live up uh, the standards of uh, the high standards of political action uh, and it seems to me very important. Um, the political positions of ancient Stoics are known, although it's not a simple question too. Uh, Andrew Erskine, in his work, The Hellenistic Stoic, Political Thought and Action, showed how the political sympathies of Stoics changed from Zena to the late Republic and further. Uh, but I wanted to ask you about the politics uh, of modern Stoicism. What kind of political position do you think the followers of modern Stoicism should uh, adhere to? 
can there be an affiliation with uh, only one political side, for example, I don't know, some kind of left wing social democratic, or is it pos possible different political affiliations within um, modern stoicism movement? Yes, that's, I mean, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's something that's had quite a lot of discussion recently. And I mean, there's a, there's, uh, there's been some concern by a few people, particularly in America, about people with quite right wing sympathies in America being interested in stoicism and a, a stress on the kind of sort of, you know, you know militaristic attitude. And uh, it's all about courage and toughness and resilience. And um, they like the fact that Marcus Aurelius was an emperor and a soldier and all of this kind of stuff. And it becomes very kind of macho. Um, and so that's one kind of one kind of way in which some people have taken up stoic ideas. Um, I mean, I think one thing that we see throughout, uh, the other thing I think is worth stressing as well, is we talk about stoicism in antiquity. I mean, we're starting with Zeno in 300 BC, and we go right through to Marcus Aurelius in 200 AD. I mean, this is 500 years cutting across a whole series of different political contexts and, 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 and cultures. So it's not surprising that there's a huge amount of variety in the way in which they respond to politics. Um, but one idea that seems to be consistent all the way through from the very beginning um, with Zeno and Chrysippus, in, also in Seneca and Epictetus and also in Marcus Aurelius is the idea of cosmopolitanism. That comes up again and again, right? So the idea that we treat all human beings as equals and fellow citizens within a single community, um, that seems like a core Stoic idea, no matter what. And so in that sense, I would say that, that Stoicism has no time for kind of narrow nationalism. Um, yeah. I think that's really important. And the other idea, which is very closely connected, which... Um, people are stressing a lot at the moment in the modern Stoic movement, which I mentioned a little earlier, is the connection with environmentalism and the idea that human well-being is connected and dependent on the well-being of nature as a whole. Um, and of course, any, any realistic solutions to environmental problems are going to involve a global solution. So those two ideas, I think, fit very closely together. And um, so for my money, those look like core Stoic ideas that, that ought to connect to any modern Stoic thinking about politics. Yes, uh, I, I agree with that too. Uh, so I, I have one more question. Uh, Nietzsche, somewhere called uh, the philosophical schools of antiquity, uh, experimental laboratories in which many recipes for the art of living were invented. Uh, so today we can combine the fruits of all philosophical schools, something from Epicureanism, something from Stoicism, and so on. Uh, how do you feel about such syncretism? There was an eclectic school in antiquity too, uh, but it seems to me that in antiquity such syncretism would rather be condemned. Yeah, I mean, I'm... In some ways, I'm quite sympathetic, right? And as you might expect, having written about both Stoicism and Epicureanism, I mean, I think it's fairly clear that in the early period um, in Athens, the two schools were quite strongly opposed to one another. And we see references to quite nasty polemics between the two groups. Um, but later on, as, as you mentioned earlier, someone like Seneca, is quite happy to draw on some Epicurean ideas. I mean, not all, obviously, but some. And um, he's also a great admirer of the Epicurean poet Lucretius, and he quotes him quite often as well. And um, I, think, I think it's quite easy to overplay the differences between them. So there certainly are clear differences, such as the different attitude towards pleasure that we were talking about earlier on. But there's also quite a lot of common ground, right? So both schools of philosophy are broadly materialist. Um, 
they're both broadly empiricist. Um, so in those ways, they're both very, very different from someone like Plato. Um, they both think that the key to living a good life is um, involves internal psychological change rather than anything external. And so that the person who's managed to go through the appropriate internal change will be able to cope with a variety of circumstances. Um, and that, so as a consequence, thinking about whether, it, whether we call it um, tranquility or um, um, uh, as Zeno talks about enjoying a, a, a good flow of life, um, ultimately it looks like they're aiming at the same thing. So I think there is quite a lot of common ground. Um, and if we, if we kind of step back from the polemics and, and, and highlight the, the common ground, I think we can bring them perhaps um, you know, quite close together. But of, of course, it's important that we acknowledge um, that there are still some significant um, differences. Um, I mean, my one last thought on this, which I think is quite an important one, is that both of these were philosophies um, they weren't religions. So it's not as if you decide one day that you're going to be a Stoic and then you dogmatically believe everything that you ever read in a Stoic text. I mean, that's not how philosophy works, right? So, I mean, if we think that what we're interested in is philosophy here, then we want to retain our own independent critical judgment. And we want to um, accept the ideas that we think look convincing. And, um, and if we find some ideas in Stoicism convincing and we find some other ideas in Epicureanism convincing, then I think there's no reason why we can't take both of those. Um, and then, of course, we've got to do the work to see whether those ideas are actually consistent with one another. Um, but, I mean, that's for us to do, and, and that's why this is philosophy, and it's not kind of signing up to some kind of religion or cult where you just accept it all without thinking for yourself. Yeah, it's great answer. Thanks. Uh, I, I, I like the um, state, statement of Tony Long that he made on some Stoicon a few years ago that uh, in the morning when I teach students I'm sto Stoic and in the evening uh, in, the, in the pub I'm a Korean, something like that. So that's all my questions. Uh, John, thank you very much for the discussion. Uh, it was a great pleasure to talk with you, uh, a real Epicurean pleasure, uh, and uh, as well as uh, to edit the translations of, of your works. I, I hope I will be editor of the big book uh, on Stoicism as well. Um, and I hope that sooner or later we will be able to see each other offline, maybe at one of the Stoicons. Uh, if you ever are going to come to um, Moscow Stoic, Stoic on X, may, maybe in some post-war times, uh, we will be happy to host you and it will be a great honor uh, for the Russian Stoic uh, community. Uh, all the best. Uh, goodbye. Well, thank you so much for the invitation and for all your interest in my, in my work. I really appreciate the support. Thank you. Bye.